Well, hi, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us here again by this electronic uh, means of worship as we gather in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and uh, lift our prayers and praise and thanksgiving to Him and hear His Word proclaimed again for us. And uh, it's been a hub of activity here at, uh, at uh, the campus through this week while we had our fall break from preschool, so the preschool families were not here. Uh, we did have a number of other activities going on on campus. We had the old portion of the parking lot was scrubbed and resurfaced and restriped, and all of that looks terrific out there. And then we've also got a paint crew here who is uh, painting the, uh, all of the exteriors of all the buildings on campus. And so uh, they're actually painting as I record this. So uh, you might hear the occasional uh, uh, clamor uh, somewhere outside as they're shuffling some ladders and different things around out there as well. The Learning Center is already done, looks beautiful, and uh, ready for the kids to return this next week and uh, to complete the, uh, the fall term. And uh, we are uh, anticipating a number of other great things that are going to be coming up as well. Pretty soon we're going to have a couple of work days here on campus on the 16th and 23rd. Uh, we're going to celebrate Trunk or Treat again this year on uh, Sunday the 31st from 5 to 7.30 in the evening. If you're able to join us for that or if you'd like to help out with that, please let us know, or you can uh, bring a car, decorate your trunk, hand out candy and all that kind of stuff, and uh, it'll just be a really fun time, uh, kind of uh, re-embracing our own neighborhood and all the families that typically come and join us for that as well. A lot of activity going on here, uh, the campus uh, coming along really well, there, there's a lot to do still on the 16th and 23rd, those work days, both outside the buildings and inside the buildings. We have a, a, a list of projects we're hoping to accomplish. If you can join us for that, please come and do so. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we're going to continue this week and then one more Sunday after this, we're going to continue our series as we've been walking through the book of James, what we call the, the, the manual for maturity. It's, about, uh, it's not really about how one becomes saved and a child of God, but rather how one lives out the fact that we have been saved, and we are the children of God. So as the children of God, what should our lives really look like? And in fact, in our reading today from James, he's going to ask us a very important and pointed question. What is your life? That's going to be the, uh, the message that we're going to contemplate some today. But first, let's begin by calling on the name of the Lord. We confess our sins before him, and, and we are reminded yet again of the forgiveness that Christ won for us. Let's pray. Gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let your presence be known among us now. While we might be separated by some distance as we uh, enjoy this time of worship together through this electronic means, we know that you are indeed the tie that binds us together as one. Bind us together, O Lord, in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray this prayer of confession before him. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Amen indeed. And long before we ever knew to pray such a prayer, confessing our sins before God, he had already answered our prayer when he loved us so deeply that he sent forth his Son in mortal flesh and blood to bear our sin and to be our Savior. And so, because of all that Jesus Christ has done for you, atoning for your sins upon the cross and winning victory for you by his victorious resurrection from the dead, I want you to know your sins are forgiven, your life is made new, heaven is your home, and your hope springs eternal. Live this new life to the good and glory of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen indeed. Let's lift our voices in song of praise for him.
I want to share two scripture readings with you now. And the first one is actually going to be the gospel reading that greets us today. It's the gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. And this is verses 25 through 34. Uh, this happens in, in the middle of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. It begins in Matthew chapter 5 with the Beatitudes and Jesus on a hillside preaching to a crowd of people and and they're, they're uh, hanging on his every word. And it's through the chapters, 5, 6, 7, 8. Uh, sometimes he addresses the full crowd. Sometimes he sits privately with his disciples and, and teaches them a little bit. So right before this reading happens, he speaks about treasures and what sort of treasures we chase after in this world. And really what he tells us is don't chase after earthly treasures and storing up earthly treasures, rather... Pursue the treasures of heaven themselves. If you seek his kingdom, these things will be added to you. He's going to say that actually in this reading. But don't chase after earthly treasures. That's not what it's really all about. In fact, he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And then he says this, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, or what you will wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet... I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, now, as I mentioned before, we, we continue with our journey through the book of James. This manual for maturity is he's got a lot to teach us about living out of our lives. And, and here in this moment, he's really going to ask us to contemplate uh, a really important question. What is your life? We'll come back to that in a bit here in the, in the message. But here's what he says. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if, you harbor bitter, uh, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires to battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that the friendship of the world means hatred toward God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? But he gives us more grace. And that's, that's why, why scripture, scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. 
Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. What you do not even know will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed. With those, With those readings, readings in mind, mind folks, let's uh, lift, lift our voices again and we sing another song, song of praise for the Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Lord, bless the words and the message and make them yours. Let your spirit speak and do not let me be a stumbling block between you and your people. And we pray this in Jesus' holy name. 
Amen. Amen, indeed. You ever uh, check the horoscope in the newspaper, or maybe it's online because they don't publish a whole lot of newspapers anymore. Sometimes people love to uh, look into the horoscopes, and usually, you know, maybe it's for humor and just out of curiosity. Uh, some people uh, put a lot of weight in that little note you get in fortune cookies as well, like that's going to give you some great uh, sage advice for how you're going to go living your life and what's going to happen in the future. Some people get so obsessed that they start to uh, consult with psychics and they uh, want to read the tarot cards and they read tea leaves in the bottom of their cup or other kinds of things and all kinds of crazy weird stuff. Uh, well, you know, I was kind of looking into it some and just out of curiosity, so I, I printed out a couple of, of horoscopes for the day. This first one is for Pisces. I'm a Pisces. I'm not entirely sure what that's supposed to mean, but that's what I've been told. <laughs> but I, I looked this up on a horoscope website for uh, a moment this morning, and I, and I read this. See if you can follow. Your professional passions gain fresh momentum in the coming weeks as Venus soars through Sagittarius and supercharges your driven 10th house until November 5th. You could finally hit your stride on an important project, so don't be afraid to put in a few extra hours while your creative juices are flowing. Under these ingenious skies, you could discover a brilliant out-of-the-box strategy or start a trailblazing new endeavor. Just don't get so carried away that you, get, that you start to neglect your relationships with loved ones. Carve out quality time for your nearest and dearest. Are you attached? Get on the same page with your significant other about your long-term goals as a couple. Now, did you follow all that? Uh, your professional passions gain fresh momentum in the coming weeks as Venus soars through Sagittarius and supercharges your driven 10th house until November 5th. I only actually have one house. I don't know what that means. Venus soars through Sagittarius. Uh, okay. The rest of it maybe seems like relatively good advice. Try something new. Get on with things. Be creative. Uh, start a trailblazing new endeavor. Okay. Uh, don't get so carried away that you neglect those who are closest to you. Well, that seems like pretty good advice. All right. Well, I went on, I looked up another one. Here's another one uh, uh, that's for Capricorn. It says, the stars pave the way for peace talks starting today. The stars pave the way for peace talks. As diplomatic Venus hunkers down in your therapeutic 12th house until November 5th. What's special about November 5th? Have I missed something? Venus hunkers down in your therapeutic 12th house. What? Have you been locked in an ongoing conflict with someone in your inner circle recently? Reach out to bury the hatchet. Set the stage for a productive dialogue by acknowledging your own role in the situation. Keep your cool if a triggering issue from the past resurfaces. Do your best to work through this without flying off the handle. Okay, that seems pretty good. I looked up one more. This one is Libra. Get a load of this one. Be wary of all new friends today, as they may turn out to be Russian spies. <laughs> what? <laughs> or, or possibly wannabe astronomers. This week will go well, except for the bits that don't. And not only will those bits go badly, they'll go very badly. So everything's going to go great, except for the things that go bad. <laughs> okay, that's very helpful. Electronics and machinery will start to misbehave for you today. That happens to me every day. How about this? Blue moon caught you standing alone, but ensure you're not also caught short this weekend. <laughs> okay. Those are some strange things. People put some weird uh, uh, weight into horoscopes. And, and if you think about it, there's some weird stuff about the stars and all that kind of weird thing. Uh, you know what the 12th house is? I have no idea. How on earth do you suspect somebody's going to be Russian spies? I don't know that either. But the rest of it just seems like advice that's not just for a Pisces or a Capricorn or a Libra. Wouldn't this apply to pretty much everybody? If you're in conflict with somebody close to you, try to work it out and seek reconciliation and try not to fly off the handle. 
Okay, that ought to apply to pretty much everybody, really. Um, how about this? Uh, it, be creative and start a tra uh, trailblazing new endeavor. Don't go. Don't get so carried away that you neglect your relationships with your loved ones. Okay, well that seems like good advice as well. But you see, a lot of people they put an awful lot of weight in these things: uh, horoscopes, uh, fortune cookies, uh, psychic readers. I mean, uh, if, if if they're really psychic, why aren't they winning the lottery or something? I don't know. Uh, but they put so much weight in these, these kinds of things. A lot of people do. Why? Because everybody wants to get a little bit of a glimpse into the future. What does the future hold? What is in store for me? And there are really two different types of people that are uh, uh, looking into the future. One is the type of person who is terrified, paralyzed in fear of what the future might hold because they want to glimpse into the future to know, is there another tragedy? Is there another heartache? Is there something else I'm going to grieve? Is there going to be some sort of a disaster that I have to endure? And they just want to kind of hide away from it, hide away from that future. And there are others who want to know, is my future richly blessed with all the stuff and the status and the finances and the career success and all the things that I think are going to really uh, speak to the world and declare to the world what a great resounding success and important person I must be. I'm going to build my empire and I'm going to glimpse into the future to see, does that empire really exist? Or is there something I need to live in fear of? And both of those approaches to the future, to, uh, to, to life, are wrong. And did you notice in our, our scripture readings today, Jesus in Matthew in the, in the gospel reading and James in the inspiration of Jesus himself, they both tell us something really, really important here. I want you to get a good grip on this. You do not know what the future holds. You do not know if you will be here tomorrow. There is no guarantee that this earthly life will go on. So live today, right here, right now. The Bible says this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That's what God is calling us to, rejoice in this, in this great gift of life that he has called us to. And Jesus, in that gospel reading moment, he's saying, listen, don't be obsessed with what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear with all these earthly things and building your kingdom. You don't need to worry about all that. He says, you know, if, if God clothes the flowers of the field, how much more will he clothe you? Well, you have little faith. And he goes on to say, seek first his kingdom, God's kingdom, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. <laughs> and boy, does it ever. And James understood that. James was dealing with the day-to-day -day trials and tribulations and challenges. He was a leader of the church, the mother church of all mother churches, the Christian church right there in Jerusalem, and, and uh, from which all the uh, of Christianity would flow. And James was dealing with sinful, fallen, broken people who act in sinful, fallen, broken ways. And so God inspired James to write this letter, his manual for maturity in the Christian faith, to the church at large. James doesn't really recount how one becomes saved. What he really wants to address is how we go about living our lives knowing that we are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus died and rose again for you so that your sins would be forgiven, your life is made new, heaven is your home. And now he wants you to walk in that faith, live in that faith, and proclaim that faith to the world around. And so as we pick up the, the storyline in James, the end of chapter 3, he says this, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Live it. Uh, who, is, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by their deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. Well, what is wisdom anyway? The Bible says uh, that uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's where true wisdom is found. It's not in earthly things. He goes on to explain, if you harbor bitter, uh, bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual. It's of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, 
There you find disorder in every evil practice. That's those people who are chasing after building a kingdom for themselves and a name for themselves, a reputation for themselves. Don't chase after that. He says the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. What are you sowing? What are, what are the seeds that you're planting? Is it fear and grief and, and, and chaos? Is it, is it greed and envy, selfish ambition? Is it peace? Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. He knows that we've got conflict and trials among us. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Yeah. We shouldn't be spending what we get on our own pleasures. How many people, myself included, have prayed, Lord, just take away all of my financial worries and just let me win the lottery. And I promise I'll give at least a little bit of it back to the church. <laughs> and the rest of it I'll spend on my own selfish pleasures. That's wrong motives. You can pray such a prayer. Just be ready for God to say no. Some people make a, 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 take a, a more subtle approach. Lord, help me to acquire this next rung on the corporate ladder, this next job title, this bigger paycheck, so that I can have more stuff and bigger square footage. No, that's not really what it's all about. He goes on to explain, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means hatred toward God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think, Scripture says without reason, that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? He gives us more grace. That's why scripture says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Every time I read a moment like that, there's several moments and reminders of such a concept in scripture. Every time I read a moment like that, I'm reminded of a, a very dear friend of mine that I had a number of years ago. He was a good friend of mine. He was a mentor of mine for many, many years. And he was a guy who was richly blessed and could have been extremely pride-filled and, and uh, uh, was the envy of many people. He was a guy who had started very humbly and built a business, and that business became very successful, incredibly successful, and pretty soon he had uh, a tremendous amount of, of, of earthly riches, all the kinds of things, the kind of life that so many people look upon and envy and say, that's the empire that I want to build. You know, financial riches, multiple homes, luxurious homes in, in incredible places, all the toys, the cars, he had his own airplane and anything else that he wanted, had a, a wonderful wife and family, and everything was the envy of everyone who knew him from an earthly standpoint. And, and he told me one day that he really could have become the friend of the world, which does not mean that we, and this doesn't mean we have to hate the world. The world is God's creation. It's a beautiful place. But when he said, I could have become the friend of the world who measures everything by these earthly things until, and you guys know everything changes after the until, he said he lived his life like he was some sort of a self-righteous executive, and, and he might he was tempted to kind of brag and boast that his, his legacy of the world would be the empire that he created and the riches he would leave behind for family and friends and whoever. And that would have been his legacy until three little words changed everything for him. See, one day in his early 60s, he had symptoms he couldn't really explain, and he was uh, wrestling with some uh, exhaustion and problems. And he went to the doctor and they did a battery of tests and, and eventually the test came back and, and he heard those three words that changed everything for him. The three words were this. He sat down across from his doctor and the doctor said, you have leukemia. And all the earthly riches that he had acquired were not going to mean a thing. They couldn't overcome anything. He would pursue treatment plans, of course, and he did, but 
But all the wealth that he had acquired was never going to be able to overcome his own mortality that he suddenly found himself face to face with. The doctor said that he might live maybe 14, even 18 months. He struggled along and he survived for six months. But I give praise to God that he did not have faith in his earthly things, but he had a deep abiding faith in Christ, his Savior. And over the course of his life, he had actually lived his life walking in a good relationship with the Lord in a life of prayer and a life of worship and praise and, and outreach and open witness. And he, his real legacy that he would leave behind was not earthly riches and things, but it was the, the seeds of faith, the gospel that he had planted in so many hearts and souls, including mine. So many people walk in partnership with Jesus today because of all that he had done to share his testimony with the world. God opposes the proud, and he was tempted to become the proud, but God gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Wash your hands, you sinners. That's not just a verse that speaks to people in a season of COVID where we wash our hands a lot, and that's good, we should. That's a practice of good hygiene. But this is actually a reference to the ceremonial washing that the Jewish people would have understood. Wash your hands, be cleansed by God. That's what he was really saying. Be cleansed by God, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. He is not really saying that we need to live our lives in this perpetual uh, uh, state of fear and grief that some tragic thing might happen in the future or has, and we can't recover from it. He's not really saying that, but he's saying if your joy is found in the fleeting and the earthly, in the, in the meaningless things, then your joy will be turned to grief and your laughter to mourning. It's gonna come. Have a rightful focus on the right things where every good and gracious gift comes down from heaven. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. He goes on to say, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now, this verse gets terribly misunderstood by many people. A lot of people use that verse and they say what that means, you Christians, is you're supposed to give blanket approval to everybody for any kind of sinful life that they decide they're going to live. That's not what it says. We still recognize there is right and there is wrong and God defines what's right and what's wrong. And what's wrong in the eyes of God is sin and we condemn sin and we call people to repent and turn away from sinfulness. What this is saying is we do not look upon our neighbor and condemn them to hell and write, up, uh, write them off, wash our hands of them. They're no longer our neighbor. That's, that's condemning them to hell. What he's saying is with our neighbor, we may have to be long-suffering and patient and persistent in our witness and calling people to repent and to recognize the, uh, the ways of God and to walk in his will and his ways. We still call them into a right relationship. We don't write them off. Judgment day is only in the hands of God himself, the one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. That's what he's saying there. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. While you do not even know what will happen tomorrow, what is your life? That's the question James has been leading us to all along. All along. What is your life? And that's a powerful message, a message. It's a powerful question. It's a deep theological question. It's also a deep philosophical question. What is your life? 
Well, what's it all about? Well, what's the power of life? What's your purpose in life? <clears throat> What are the passions that you have? Uh, what do you do with your time and your talents and your treasures? Uh, what is it that, uh, that really lights your fire? What is it that floats your boat? What is it that gets you going in the morning? What is it that your life is really all about? Is it about living in fear of what the future might hold? Is it about anticipating the, the personal glories that the future might bring? What is your life? That's a, an incredibly deep question that God himself wants us to contemplate for a moment. Because you see, James goes on, he says, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. You know why he says that? Because our life is fast and it's fleeting. Some people live maybe only a few days, some people multiple decades, maybe even a hundred years, but in the grand scheme of the scale of time, even a hundred years long life is but a mist, it's fleeting. Here today, and poof, gone tomorrow. So today, what do you do with it? What are you doing with the gift of life that God has given you? That's what James has been leading us to contemplate all along. Is it living in fear? Is it building a kingdom? Or is it something that really has true meaning and purpose and value? We should live with a sense of urgency in our lives because it's so fleeting. What is your life? My life is a gift from God in Christ our Savior. And it is fleeting and it is urgent. You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. So speak his truth in love today. I'll never forget the day when I really realized that life is so fleeting and you don't know what tomorrow will bring. And we really ought to share that witness while we can right here, right now. You see, the day was June 17th, 2006. I got a phone call that morning from my mother who was frantic and distraught and, 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 and panicked and heartbroken on the phone. And she's speaking of my brother, my brother Mike, who was 42 years old at the time. And she said, he, he, he won't wake up and I, I think he's dead. I said, mom, have you, have you called 911? Yes, yeah, she had already called and they were on their way she was in such heartache and fear and grief and, and she turned out to be right. 42 years old, didn't even have a cold. Certainly was not the picture of perfect health by any means, but nobody, nobody saw that coming. He went to bed one night, didn't even stir. In the midst of the night, he went home. He passed away. And I suddenly realized that I had not, I had not shared Jesus with him. I never really sat down with, with my own brother and said, hey, I really believe in this Lord Jesus Christ. He's the maker of heaven and earth and he's redeemed and restored our very souls and he opens up heaven's gates so that we can live with him eternally. I never shared that with him. But I give thanks to God that my wife, Kathy, who is bold and devout in her faith. She had known Mike for many years by then, and, and over the course of many years, she had had off, uh, often times had had conversation about it. And, and while Mike was never really a, an out there religious, you know, a, a devout Christian, we really do believe based on the conversations that they had had that that he had embraced this truth as gospel. He had embraced this idea that Christ is indeed the savior of the world, and that he had a heavenly home for him. And with that mustard seed of faith, and the, the baptism gifts that God had given to him in his infancy, we really believe that he's home in heaven. And he awaits the day when a family reunion will take place. We rely on that hope. We'll see him again. You probably know somebody like him in your own life as well. What is your life? Your life is a gift that comes from God. Your life is a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. So we ought to say if it's the Lord's will, we, we will live and do this or that. It's our turn. It's our time. 
Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Don't keep grabbing on to horoscopes and fortune cookies and psychics and uh, fortune tellers and tarot cards. And others. Uh, Stop trying to get a little glimpse into the future. It's not something you need to live in paralyzing fear of. And stop chasing after building a kingdom for oneself. Instead, entrust yourself to the things of God and live this day right here, right now, for his good and glory. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And let us look to one another and share the love and the mercy and the grace and the gospel message of Jesus Christ. To him be the glory today and forever. Amen. Amen indeed. May the peace of God, which surpasses all of our understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the one true faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord, until that day when he receives us home. Amen. Amen indeed. Let's lift our voices again in a song of praise for him. Let's pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us with this opportunity to gather together in your name and in worship and prayer and praise and thanksgiving before you. And we know that we might be separated by distance, but you indeed are the tie that binds us together as one, who unites us as the family of faith at Hosanna. We thank you, Lord, for uniting us to one another, for gathering us to be the body of Christ at work in this corner of your mission field. And we, and we ask, ask you to continually bless our efforts so that they, they may be of service to you in reaching the people who don't know you and drawing them in, 
and bring bringing in comfort and strength to those, those who do know you already. Bless, Bless our, our efforts and make them fruitful for your name's sake. Lord, Lord in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. Lord, Lord as a church, we thank you for blessing us with the, the resources that we have needed to address so many things on our campus, the painting of the buildings and the, uh, the resurfacing of the, of the parking lot and uh, the restoration of the air conditioning units that are going in uh, again as well. And and so, so many other things, things, Lord. We thank you for being at work and uh, creating a spirit of generosity in and through your people here at Hosanna so that we can afford to make these things happen. It's a wonderful blessing that that parking lot is so worn out because the people come. It's a wonderful blessing that these buildings are refreshed in their, in their outward appearance so that people may be drawn in and on the inside hear the good news of Christ our Savior. It's, it's a, a wonderful, wonderful experience, Lord, Lord to, to see the, uh, the, the mechanical uh, elements of our, our campus, campus also addressed so that we can gather in comfort that allows us to focus our hearts and our lives on you. And we thank you for this great gift. And now, and now Lord, we ask, we ask you to welcome back the, 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 the children and the families to our preschool as they come back into school this, this next week. Uh, uh, be, be at work, work in and through your people, people our staff and our volunteers and all of our congregations so that we might be the, the welcoming and loving voice of Jesus and the arms of Jesus bringing comfort. Bless our efforts, Lord, so that more and more of those families may, may receive that gospel message and let it grow in their own hearts so they too may mature in the faith and their service to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, Lord, we pray, pray be at work in the lives of the people that we know in our own families and circles who are broken and hurting in body and soul. Provide the medical teams and experts and resources necessary to treat their ailments effectively. Be with those who are hurting and those who keep vigil with them, that they may fix their eyes on Jesus in the midst of all adversity. Lord, be also with those whose hearts are held in grief. And especially this day, we pray, be with the family and friends of Doris Stanky, who is been laid to rest on your holy ground in the place where your saints are kept. Bless those family and friends that they may continue to grow in the very faith that she planted in them, that faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Keep us steadfast in the faith as we walk this earthly journey. And one day in your good time, receive us home and gather us there on that beautiful shore. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into, into your hands, O Lord, we can and all for whom we pray, trusting in your great mercy and grace, as you've you made it known to us through Jesus our Savior, who taught, taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours, yours is the kingdom, kingdom and the power and the glory, glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen, Amen indeed. Receive, Receive the blessing of the Lord, Lord and the benediction God, God himself has commanded us to pray over his people so that God himself can fulfill this promise. The Lord, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord, Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord, Lord look upon you with his favor and give to you his peace. Amen. Amen indeed. As, As I mentioned, mentioned before, before, you know, there's all kinds of activities happening now and in the next few weeks here on campus. Come and join us for anything that you might be able to. If there's, there's anything we can be doing for you in the meantime, please contact us and let us know. We have to do whatever it is we can. And gather with us again whenever you can so that we can unite our hearts together in worship and praise and thanksgiving before the Lord. And go in God's peace, for we are His children. Amen. Amen. We lift, we lift up, up one final song of praise, praise for him. Thanks, Thanks for, for joining us. us.